people often ask is, is this stereotyping? You know, if we start to talk about a particular patient from the standpoint of their culture, their race, their ethnicity, is this stereotyping? And it's a great question, and it's an important question. I'm glad people ask that question because I think it's, it's important for us to be in that inquiry. Um, I draw a distinction between archetypes and stereotypes. Archetypes are cultural patterns that lead us to understand the general needs of a population. When we take those general needs of a population and we assume that it's true of everybody in that population group, then we're turning into a stereotype. Let me give you an example of what I mean. If I were to ask you, are men taller than women, of course we would say yes. In fact, that's true in every culture of the world. If I were to ask you if every man is taller than every woman, you would say, of course not. We all know women who are taller than men. And yet, if we were, for example, to open a clothing store and we're looking to how to stock that clothing store, we wouldn't just stock equal numbers from all across the board uh, of product. We would have product that matched up with the general archetypes of the population. Um, we would have more products for taller men and fewer products for taller women and vice versa because that's the pattern. What we're trying to do is to get people to use the tool not to make assumptions but to ask questions. Um, for example, if we know that in Vietnamese culture, women are taught to drink warm water during uh, labor and childbirth uh, rather than cold water, we're not suggesting that a nurse assume because some, somebody's Vietnamese that they give them warm water. What we are suggesting is that you know to ask the question, what temperature water would you like? That's where it becomes helpful. That's where we avoid stereotyping and use the archetype to its best advantage. There are lots of very specific ways that uh, culture uh, impacts interaction, but, um, but particularly in ways that a lot of people don't even realize in the actual medical um, interaction, the actual specifics of medicine. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Uh, African-American men react to beta, blo beta blockers much differently than Caucasians do. Ca beta blockers are medications that are given to people to help control heart disease. Uh, they're one of the most highly tested medications in all of medicine. Um, very effective and very important to help uh, lots of cardiac problems. African-American men, when they take beta blockers, sometimes um, have a reaction which ends up resulting in a phenomenon that's almost like mini strokes. It can be dangerous to the patient. It can be very easily resolved by treating the patient additionally with a mild diuretic that balances out the, the effect. But the problem is that a lot of physicians don't know about this. In fact, up until 15 years ago, only about 15% of all of the drugs in the physician's death reference were even tested across culture. So a physician knowing those kinds of things can treat a patient more effectively. So we're looking not just for the sort of surface cultural interactions, not just communication and things like that, although all those are important. We're also delving into hard medicine and how this affects things like the chemical imbalances in people's body, the, the disease of prevalence that they tend to have because of the culture that they come from, and also what are the medicines that work best to treat them. We talk about cultural humility because we think it's important for people to realize that uh, we're raised, it, most of us are raised in a uh, culture in which we're taught that our way of doing things is the right way of doing things. It's the natural thing to happen. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, that's the way we teach our children. You know, it's, it's right to look people in the eyes. It's, it's right to shake hands in a particular way. It's right to have a particular value system. And of course, everybody is raised that way within their own culture. Um, so when we talk about cultural humility, what we mean is really an understanding that um, we have our right way and they have their right way. It's like lenses that we see the world through. Um, and if we can understand that those lenses are different for other people, we can begin to reach across that gap and meet them where they are rather than to assume that they're doing it wrong. Now, there are a number of factors in this that are really important. One is the ability to understand our culture as a culture. It requires us to put a flashlight on ourselves, to see ourselves in action, um, to understand that the things that we're doing aren't necessarily you know, presumed to be true, it's just the way we were taught. And once we see our own culture in that way, we can also look at another person and we can say, you know, how are they reacting consistent with their culture? And begin to see the uniqueness of each person's experience, even as they have common cultural threads that run through their entire experience. We don't believe that culture vision is a standalone resource that will solve any 
organization's cultural competency problems by itself. We see it as part of a broader solution to developing culture-based systemic change within organizations that helps organizations become more culturally competent. Um, without the kind of education that people need to understand cultural competency, without the systems and structures in place, culture vision ends up being a tool that can't really use be used effectively. You know, it's very much like giving somebody a belt sander who doesn't understand what carpentry is. It'll sit on the shelf um, or it'll be used inappropriately. So what we're trying to do with Culture Vision is to provide people with a very effective, robust tool that can help them with their cultural competency solutions. We expect that there are going to be times when we're going to have people who call us, contact us, send us emails and say, you know, I saw something on the site that I disagreed with or it's not true from my experience or it doesn't represent my experience of my own group. And, um, you know, first of all, we welcome that. We welcome when people are rigorous enough to not only read it and see that but also to react and give us the feedback. Um, and we understand that that's the case because people have their own individual experiences inside of the larger cultural experiences we're talking about. So we've designed two very specific ways that we address that. You know, one is that we constantly research new information. We've got our medical researchers looking at um, new research that's coming out of laboratories all around the country, at articles that come out of the Journal of the American Medical Association or the New England Journal of Medicine, for example. Um, we look at double-blind studies that come up. We're constantly updating the research to make it more current so that we can be as up-to-date as possible. The second thing we've done is we've built into the website itself a place where users can very easily send us an email and tell us, I've got a concern about this particular fact or this fact is different from my experience. And as soon as we get those messages, we quickly get that question to our researchers and we look for the resolution to the question. So we specifically look for information to find out what the answer is. Now there are times when there are multiple points of view. There might be two different points of view in answer to a question. In which case, we may list both of them and say, here are two different points of view about this particular question. But the important thing to recognize is we're not trying to be prescriptive with any of this information. We're not trying to tell people what to believe or encourage their assumptions. We're simply trying to give them the more, most current information that research gives us is available and help that inform their decisions in terms of how they're going to best serve their patients. How do we get people to avoid stereotyping? Um, one of the things is to really help them understand that what Culture Vision is about is providing our typical information about culture. It's not suggesting that every person in a culture acts in a particular way. In fact, the opposite is true. We know that there are lots of individual variation within cultures. We know that people are exposed to many different cultures, particularly today when many families have people from different cultures who get married or um, who are in relationship of one kind or another. And so we're not suggesting that cultural patterns are definitive, nor that people take them and apply them. What we find is really helpful in people avoiding stereotyping is using questions rather than answers. I like to say turning our exclamation points into question marks. So if I learn something about a culture rather than assuming that that means it's true of the particular cultural group, I simply say, is this an issue for you? Is this a concern for you? Let's say, for example, that I have a patient of, um, from some Asian culture. Um, and I've learned that there are particular herbal medications that that culture uses. Um, I wouldn't assume necessarily, or we wouldn't want our, the practitioner to assume that the patient is using that herbal remedy, but they might say, do you use any herbal remedies or do you use this particular remedy in your family? Um, it's important because we know that certain herbal remedies conflict with some of the other medicines that we use. So rather than assumptions, we encourage people to ask questions. We want culture vision to be out there being used by as many people as possible. I mean, we are confronting real issues in terms of healthcare in our country. We've got health disparities that are still enormous, particularly for African American and Latino Hispanic populations. Uh, in virtually every major illness, there are people who, you know, for example, Mexican Americans two and a half times the level of diabetes as, as white Americans do. African Americans have extremely higher rates of diabetes, heart disease. Um, I could go through the list, but really in every major major disease. Um, 
being able to understand the cultures of people, being able to understand the way medicine impacts people differently, being able to know patterns of disease is a critical part in resolving those health disparities. What we've tried to do is to make culture vision as affordable as possible to as many people as possible, to get it out there. And we're thrilled because we now have literally hundreds of hospitals around the country who are using it. We've got people in uh, health insurance companies, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield companies. We've got people in medical school and people in nursing schools using it. And our hope is um, that that will continue to expand. We uh, took the Haitian uh, page from, health, from Culture Vision and printed it out and sent it out to all the relief organizations to use during the relief effort after the Haitian earthquake. We know that we got feedback from a lot of people that that was helpful. So um, we're doing everything we can because we really believe that this issue of culture and health is critical to our being able to have a health system that functions not only for people in our country, but also deal with some of the financial aspects of health that we have to deal with as a society. What we focus on helping people develop cultures in their organizations that are more diverse, more inclusive, and more culturally competent. And uh, we do that in lots of ways. We help people with the strategy um, that they employ. Um, how do you develop a strategic plan around developing an inclusive organization? A lot of times where diversity and inclusion is concerned, we see people who think that if you do a diversity training, Black History Month, and International Food Day in a cafeteria, that you can then check diversity off the calendar. But in fact, we know that we need to understand substantial uh, culture change in organizations to really get people to understand the way cultures and organizations develop, the way behaviors are reinforced, um, the way messages are sent. Um, and so we do a lot of work strategically in that way. We do work in developing training programs and education initiatives and uh, helping people in that way. And some of that involves train-to-trainer programs and developing e-learning programs and things like that. And then we also develop the kinds of support tools that we have in culture vision, the kinds of tools that can help people once they're on the right track, once they want to go in the right direction, um, that'll help them get there. You know, Will Rogers once said that just because you're on the right track doesn't mean you won't get run over if you just sit there. And um, we know that there are an awful lot of people who believe in cultural competency who still need support in the way of handy tools to help them get there, and that's really what Culture Vision is about.